I think going back to high school for me is when I started using Apple products along with music technology. It was always the one platform that was really helping people create, not forcing them to uh, conform their ideas to the technology. Apple makes, I believe, the best operating systems on the planet. Every time I've interacted with it, it's felt natural, it's felt right, it's been easy. I don't think I've ever needed an instruction manual for anything that Apple's put out. My job at the university, setting up a new computer for a faculty member, was very tedious. We had lots and lots of people that were working on the Windows side, but it was my job to, to take care of the Macs. And it had always kind of been a, a second-class citizen on campus, and our goal was to try and make it a first-class citizen. So we had started building software in, uh, in our IT department at the university. Our idea with building software was to kind of put ourselves out of a job. Our goal was to automate all the things that we were responsible for doing on a daily basis. We decided to branch out of the university in 2002. We want to make sure that we can reach the entire world with it. We went to a bar, we came up with a name for a company. Uh, we came up with a code name for the product, which ended up sticking. Uh, the next day we drove to Minneapolis to the Mall of America Apple Store and bought our first eMac. And the next day we were writing our first lines of code. When Zach showed me Casper, it was amazing. It was ahead of where all the other products were. If you go back to the creation of the original Macintosh, what Apple did better than anybody else was put users at the center of the equation. And where Jamf can really benefit Apple customers is to you know, give that same level of user experience for an institution. I think there definitely used to be this mentality that Apple could never succeed in the enterprise. I think we always thought that that was a false statement that was set out of ignorance rather than out of actual knowledge. And our goal has been to prove that sentiment wrong. Jamf Nation is a really important tool for us to use to keep a tenor on how, what is the unfiltered conversation going on out there in the world. There's a user conference that we do, which is the largest Apple administrative conference in the world. But the other part of it is the online forum. Users can put in requests, and with the 9.0 release, we had over 100 features that were added to the product that came directly out of the community. For a school to be as happy with a thousand iPads, a thousand Macs, for a business to be happy with 35,000 Macs, at the same level I'm happy with my iPhone, is one of the greatest things we can do. Our history of almost 12 years of focusing so much on the Apple platform and successful rollouts in the enterprise is something that we're going to continue to do. It's what we've been focused on our entire life at Jamf, and we look forward to doing that more and more in the future. All right. Eight. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, this is, uh, this is great to be back here with everybody for the uh, sixth annual Jamf Nation User Conference. Jamf Nation, thanks so much for showing up and, uh, and being a part of it uh, today. Um, you know, this is a week that we put together really kind of dedicated to a couple of things. It's about sharing, it's about learning, and maybe having a little bit of fun along the way. Now, I was a little disappointed about the mini event response. I was listening backstage. How many people are signed up for mini events? <laughs> all right, yeah, all right. Now, there's a lot of stuff happening in the evenings, a lot of stuff happening during the day, and we're gonna have, well, a good time. And, you know, to quote uh, the Cosby Show back from the 70s, you know, if you're not careful by the end of this, you might just learn something, you know, but we're gonna have a great time here doing this. This is the largest JNUC that we've ever done. Over 1,750 people are registered for this JNUC, which is huge. We look at the attendance over the years, and uh, it's pretty amazing to watch, uh, watch you guys keep coming back. Very cool. Uh, this year, we have 45 US states represented. We have 20 different countries and people from five different continents coming to the JNUC. You know, we've got 350 people from Minnesota alone. Minnesotans, are you out there? Yes. All right, keep those hands up, Minnesotans. 
Let's show our friends a good time and show them what Minnesota Nights really means. All right. Well, now, when we, uh, when we do this, uh, we like to call out a number of people. How many people? I saw Don in the back row, right about in the middle here. How many people have been to every JNUC? Yes, thank you. How many people are coming back? You've gone to at least one. Very nice. And how many people, last but not least, is this your first JNUC? Yeah. All right. Because you got to fight. No, I'm just joking. The, uh, all right. So uh, everybody, it's your first year. Um, find somebody who's been around. There's about half the crowd has uh, been here before. They'll show you how to have a good time at this, and we will have programming. It goes late into the night and starts early in the morning as well. As my dad used to tell me in high school, you can hoot with the owls, but you're going to soar with the eagles. Now, the JNUC started out, the JNUC started out really out of a bunch of small user groups that we used to do. And these user groups are a lot of fun. They're really intimate. This is not our entire customer base back then, but pretty damn close. <laughs> pretty close. The very first one of these user groups that we ever did was in San Francisco at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference, and we had a ticket. We got to go to WWDC in 2003, and it was awesome. Steve was up on stage, and they released the iSight camera, and he demoed it, and it had the lens. It was beautiful, a firewire connection right into your laptop, and surprised and delighted everybody because we all got one. He gave everybody away, and the problem was you couldn't talk to anybody except people who were at the conference. Nobody else had them yet, but we were there talking with each other, and it was a ton of fun. At that first uh, user group, you know, we really, uh, it really started some things for us about listening and hearing, and hearing what people were actually interested, not just in what we thought people needed. And it's really profoundly shaped Jamf, the company, and Casper, the product, over the years. The type of insights we get through forums like this. And uh, if you guys get a chance to visit the UX designers, I know those folks would love to see you and hear your ideas of how the product can be better in that way. Going back to 2010 with the very first JNUC, a rented place above a bar, and we learned a lot of important things. We learned a lot of important things. We wanted to make what we were doing in the user groups a little bit more formalized, a little bit bigger. And uh, so we did our first JNUC, and we learned. We learned that November is a terrible time for Minnesota to come, people to come to Minnesota. <laughs> not a good time. We also learned that one urn of coffee is not enough for 100 people. <laughs> Logistics. And, but more importantly, we realized that despite all that, people really wanted to come together to learn and share and have a sense of community around around the Apple platform and organizations. In 2011, we found our, uh, whoa, that's the backwards button. 2011, we found our permanent home here at the Guthrie. And as Blaine mentioned about the lunches, guys, that's the hardest thing about continuing to use this space is being able to feed everybody in the amount of time we've got. But otherwise, you know, Mitch, his crew have taken great care of us since the very first year that we did this with 269 people at that first JNUC. Now then, you know, we've always had like the Guthrie sets behind us. And I was looking, I was, I, for the life of me, I couldn't get Zach to sit up on the porch and whittle while we were doing this, <laughs> but man, I wanted to. You know, the first one, it looked like Castle Grayskull or Stonehenge, and we came out, I was like, Rrr. felt very cool. 2012, the numbers keep growing, we're up to 535 people. 2013, 735 people. 909 people last year, and we couldn't imagine a bigger JNUC than last year until we got to this year. We were already past last year's registration numbers back in June, month before we'd announced any sessions, which was awesome. So as we're getting ready to get into this, there's like three, feeling, three feelings that yesterday when I was reflecting back on this, thinking about the six years of doing this, and it's really a sense of gratitude, first and foremost, that you guys are interested in hanging out with us and with each other and sharing. We're profoundly grateful for that. Second thing is just, a, just an overbubbling sense of optimism. Because despite everything good that's happened in the past, and we'll talk about that a little bit, we couldn't be more excited about where, where we're going together. 
and that optimism and the excitement that we feel at Jamf and that we see from you guys and we're going to share it in this week can really go beyond the time that we're physically here together and carry us through the year into all the things that we do. Now, 13 and a half years ago, that video is a little bit old, 13 and a half years ago, to me it seems like yesterday. To me it seems like yesterday. I was going through photos thinking about this and I came across a couple of pictures from Zach and I when we started. <laughs> now, I said it seems like yesterday, but I don't know who these children are in this picture because they don't look at anything like the men that, you know, that have aged through this process so well. <laughs> The, uh, and so back then, back in those days when Jamf was just really starting to become a thing, we, we came up with some really simple ideas. Now at first this wasn't easy, right? At first this wasn't easy. We were system administrators, Zach at, a school, at university and me at the Baby Bell, and, and we really didn't know what to do to build a software company. We didn't know what to do. So we did what a lot of angsty, post-adolescents do, and we just did the opposite of everything we hated. We said if something sucked, we'd do the opposite of it. We weren't going anywhere, we were just moving away from negativity. We looked at the relationships that we had with our vendors, we looked at the tools that are available for us, and we said if something sucks, well, we'll just do the opposite of that. And that's how we came up with unlimited support, a licensing scheme that doesn't lock you out beyond your seat count. All of those things came from our experience. But at a certain point, much like that angsty post-adolescent becoming an adult, we had to actually stand for something, not just be against things we didn't like. You actually had to think about this. And so we looked back and we thought about Casper as a product and we thought, you know, this was the tool that we wanted to use when we were sysadmins. That we made the tool that we wanted to use that wasn't available. And it starts with the product. The second thing is it came down to the company relationships. As I mentioned a couple of things about support or licensing, we wanted to make the company we wanted to purchase from. We actually like, really went through and said, you know, if we were doing this the way we wanted to buy from somebody, how would we build a company around that? And that became really important for not only Casper the product, but Jamf the company. And we went on for a couple of years and fortunately a few people believed in the product, tried it out, gave us a chance and uh, started building a little bit of momentum until we were ready to hire people. Now, anybody who spent more than five minutes with me will know I'm a little bit anti-establishment, just a little bit. And I had in thoughts about all my previous employers, and maybe Zach had a couple too, and we said, we want to be the employer that we wanted to work for. How would we set up a relationship between a, a business and employees that would have been a place we wanted to work? And that was the third thing. How would we be an employer that we wanted to be? And lastly, recently with a little bit of success that we've had, how do, how do successful companies act in their communities? How do we have a sense of social responsibility at the same time, take care of all the business aspects of what it takes to run a business? And we really thought about how do successful companies be in their communities, and, uh, and that's given us some ideas about some stuff we'd like to do. Now, all of these ideas about products, company, employment, and community, are, are true in a lot of the stuff we've measured. And I'm gonna share with you guys a little bit, the narrative I was thinking was is like this love story that's existed between us, our users, and Apple. That, you know, all around the Apple platform and just how much goodness has come over the last couple of years. Now, when we started out, it was early in the OS 10 days. We actually, with the first version of Casper, still supported Mac OS 9. We still had recon for Mac OS 9 machines that were out there. And we had a chance when OS 10 was very new to work with it. The release of the iPhone OS, up through the multiple versions of iPhone, the switch from Motorola processor, processors to Intel processors was not insignificant at the time. And then the steady drumbeat in improvements to Mac OS 10. We look at the stores and the way that we interact with Apple technologies and how that's evolved. Jamf formed in 2002, the year after the very first Apple store in Falls Church at Tyson's Corner, before the iTunes store, before the App Store, before the Book Store, before VPP, and now Apple Pay. All new technologies from Apple that present a ton of options 
for our customers. The multiple iterations of cloud services that Apple's put out. We've been, uh, I'm still .Mac at my personal email address. I hang on to that. I didn't even cut to .me, but mobile me into iCloud. Ah, uh, and then the Mac, the Mac. So many of us started our careers supporting the Mac, and we think about the evolution from the Quicksilver G4 that was new, through the swivel-headed iMac, through iBooks, MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros, Mac Pros, the Mini, all of this stuff, all of these wonderful Macintoshes that have come out since we've been doing this together. Then last but not least, all the post-PC devices. The first iPod shipped the year before uh, we started as a company. We had no idea where this was going to go. No idea at all. And the iPod, to the phone, to the pad, to the watch. That is a ton of new technology and new services that we've got to see while we've been doing this together. And every step of the way, we've been there supporting every iteration of this hardware and of these services. Awesome, awesome to look back, especially some of those early young logos when we didn't know about graphic design very well. <laughs> we didn't know a lot. We still don't know a lot. We got a lot to learn. Now, we did a study uh, recently, and we're going to be publishing the results of this soon, but I wanted to share a couple of things with you about what we're seeing and how the market is really perceiving Apple. It's on the rise. No big surprise to anybody in this room. But when we looked at the percentage of companies reporting growth of Apple products in colleges and in K-12 school districts this, la this last year. It's huge increases in all the product lines in business and in education. If we look at how system administrators view this stuff, Mac and iOS are easier to administer than anything else, than anything else. This is Mac and iOS versus everything easier to manage. And when it comes to security, the same thing is true. More secure than everything else on the market. Schools and businesses believe in Mac and iOS, and it's more secure than ever. Now, the other thing, so all these, all these bits of data are what statements. What is the view on this? But why? is oftentimes so much more important. And when we look at the top reasons why businesses and schools are adopting Apple technology, the first thing for both groups is users prefer it. And at the end of the day, our job is not to allow or disallow choices. Our job is there to take care of the users, at school, whether it's students and teachers in a school, or whether it's people in a business, a government organization, or an NGO. The number one thing driving all this is users prefer it. The other commonality between schools and businesses is security. Now, there's some other reasons up there as well, but you know, I don't know that we've really got to you know, share this as much. This is more reaffirming what I think many of us have known, and we'll be publishing this study out shortly for you guys to uh, take a look at and share with people. So we've got some what statements. We've got this richness of hardware, operating systems, and services. We know the motivators. And what's, what's been the results with Apple? What's been the results of their focus and their products? This is nothing short of astronomical. What's happened from the near-death experience back in 1997 to where we're at today. This is literally the phoenix rising from the ashes. Now, we, we run a couple of these numbers out for another five years because we think the charts are going to keep on going. We think the charts are going to keep on going. Now, what's really interesting when you look at it was Jamf Software was formed here. We had no idea what was going to happen. But the joke that we had was we would rather go broke with Apple than make money with anybody else. Back in the 90s, from about here, to here, I lived in Seattle, Washington. Now, there is a suburb of Seattle called Redmond. <laughs> and back between 95 and 99, there was this other software company from Redmond. 
And then everybody was around that, and they were feeling really good. And they even named their operating systems after the year they came out, or at least the year they were scheduled to come out. <laughs> and, and I would go to these parties as a young person in this town where everybody was very full of their operating systems of 95 and 98 and feeling really good about themselves. And I'd get in and we'd talk IT a little bit. And then eventually the question would come around, well, and what do you do? Now, my response at that time was, well, I'm a garbage man. I said, wow, you sure know a lot about TCP IP for a garbage man. And I said, well, actually, I'm a Mac system administrator, but I thought you'd respect me more if I told you I was a garbage man. <laughs> True story. And they did. The rest of that is all history now, and the present and where we're going is really what's important. Let's take a look backwards on, on a few other things as well, though. At Jamf, we, we measure the success by how many users' lives are changed by using Apple products in organizations. So we look at the success by users, and we are over 5 million endpoints that you guys are managing, who, people whose lives are touched by Apple technologies. This is students and teachers, and this is better teacher effectiveness, and this is better student outcomes. These are scientists, designers, researchers, people in business, solving many of the problems that we as a species face, both economically, ecologically, and politically. I don't have to describe these people to you because these are the people you guys support every day in your day-to-day -day job. We are agents of change, guys. We allow the world to change and unfold in a much more positive way by giving people technology that gets out of their way so they can do what they're trying to do with it. Now, when we look at this, it's not just users, but it's about organizations as well. Over the 13 years that Jam's been in business, we look at how many distinct organizations are managing their Apple estate with our products. Every week, we share the number of users with every Jamf, as well as the number of organizations. This is part of our fulfillment of trying to be the software company that doesn't suck, that we wanted to do business with. And we measure these things not against any other market data, but against the mission of trying to serve people who are trying to change the world with Apple products. Certified Casper admins. How many people have a certification in the room? Yes. Yes. Everybody else, we got sign-ups for classes? <laughs> when we started doing this, Mac admin wasn't even considered a job. It wasn't a job. It was a secondary task that was somewhere after IPX, SPX, Netware, and NT, and then Mac. Now it's a career. And we see people taking the steps to improve themselves and the uptake of this. Your schools are investing in your education. Your businesses are trying to help you be better so you can help more people be better. We think this is an amazing trend and we expect to see these numbers go up as this becomes more and more of a career for people and not a secondary afterthought that we tack on after Novell services. So, old school. <laughs> there is a direct correlation between Jamf and bringing in our people. We're closing in on 500 people. We'll probably be there in November of this year. And we never imagined we would have so many smart, nice, and hardworking people working at Jamf. We feel really fortunate. And even though we might not have everything figured out exactly right, um, it's part of our commitment to being the employer that we wanted to be when we were on that metaphorical eve of hiring our first employee. Jamf Nation members, community. Now, we talked about the, uh, you know, the 1,750 people registered for, uh, for the conference. We saw over 1,000 people on our roadshow between Australia, between the UK, and around the US. And those in real life experiences where we can get together eyeball to eyeball, have a cup of coffee, drink a beer, go for a walk by the river, hang out with each other are really, really important. Social platforms, though, are big as well. And we have over 26,000 people on the online community today. Part of this is about making a resource available in the footsteps that we're following of AFP 548, of MacEnterprise.org, 
Max Slash, and some of the great, great resources that have been available to people over the years that are about our whole community. In this, it's not limited to people using Casper. There are discussions for all Mac admins, job boards, and we're, we see it more of a stewardship than we do anything else, and we're happy to continue to do this. As Blaine mentioned, the Jamf Nation Global Foundation, again, part of the community. When we started this uh, back in 2013, we, we looked at, you know, what did we want to do? What did success mean for a company? And what should you do with it? What do you give back? What do you do for other people? And we wanted to put our time and our money to work. And by the end of this year, we'll have over a quarter million dollars of money donated to 503C non-profitable organizations, and we'll have over 3,000 volunteer hours. Because it's not just about writing a check, it's going out and packing food for Haiti, it's going and cleaning up the river, it's going and being a part of these things that our people are given time away from work to do things that really matter. We started doing that as a group, and I think we're gonna be opening up, if we haven't yet, to you guys coming and joining in us, because we usually have a good time and then go for beers afterwards. So, you will have an opportunity to participate uh, in the fun run, though, tomorrow morning. How many people are planning right now to get up at 7 a.m. and go run 5K? Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. I'll run with you. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there at 7 a.m. running, and I'm going to do the 5K, and I'd love to have a bunch of people doing it. For every runner, and for every spectator in the cheering section, we had PBR tall boys a couple of years ago, which seems like bad decisions at 7 a.m. <laughs> um, especially while you're running, like nothing I want more than a beer, you know? <laughs> then I'll go have breakfast. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, we want, it's $25 per runner, $25 per spectator in the cheering section, with a goal of generating $25,000 to be donated to both Genesis Works and Girls Who Code. We hope you guys are able to be there. Thanks, Art. Let's so kind of wind down my section here, guys. Um, at the heart of all this is there's a choice that we make. There's a choice we make as IT practitioners because making something very hard for people to use is easy. Making something very easy for people to use is hard. And in all the things we do, we take that complexity on ourselves to make it simple for our users. And we think about the initial Macintosh. We think about why we are so attracted to Apple products is because a lot of that complexity is taken out of it for us. It's just simple to use. It's just there and it just works. It's a way that it's been from the beginning. And you guys are fulfilling the promise for organizations on this every day. You take a tremendous amount of complexity on yourselves to make it simple for your teachers, for your students, for your businesses. I had a chance uh, last week, to, or two weeks ago, to meet uh, the great poet warrior Rice. And he said to me a very important thing. He said, IT's job being easier doesn't make better organizations. Guys, IT's job being easier does not make your organizations better, but you do. With that, I'm gonna introduce Zach Holmstead, my friend, my partner, my business partner, and our co-founder. Z. Good morning, everyone. The uh, hands down best part of my job is the people. Uh, people I work with inside Jamf and the people I get to work with in our community. Um, this is why I still show up after 13 and a half very fun but very long years. Uh, as Chip mentioned, we are uh, well over 5,600 organizations that are supporting over 5 million devices. In the audience right here, we have almost 1,000 people from those 5,600 organizations. And if we go over to the Persinium Hall, I think there's about another 200 in there right now watching. Hey, guys. Uh, again, those 5,600 organizations are responsible for over 5 million devices. And your organizations put you guys in charge of power, empowering your end users with that technology. 
you and your organizations then come to us and you rely on Jamf to help with that, that task. Software is a big part of that, but it's not the only part. Uh, one of the phrases that we use a lot internally is supporting those who support others. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements inside the organization this year. Uh, and the number one thing that we've been looking at is uh, our world-class support. We have a 31% increase in our staff, and we actually have 180% increase in the hours that our, our support staff actually works right now. We have 24-7, 365 support available uh, worldwide for our Encompass customers. Uh, the Encompass itself, we have a 72% uptake in people that are subscribing to Encompass. This gives them a dedicated team focused on their individual needs with regular on-site visits. In our training, Chip mentioned earlier, how many people are using that? We've got a 68% increase in our, our training pass, giving you access for every single person inside your organization to take those courses. And we've actually increased by almost 50% the number of courses that we offer. But outside of the, the walls of Jamf, there's a lot of other things that are there to help support you. Jamf Nation turns four in November. The membership and activity on, on Jamf Nation has continued to increase at an incredible rate. The knowledge and experience of the teams that are out there that are helping you and helping each other is absolutely phenomenal. Thanks to everyone in this room and everyone in our community that helps make Jamf Nation a, a success. They're not making it a success for Jamf, they're making it a success for all of you. Uh, again this year, we'd like to recognize a few of our top community members and something we call the Dean's List. Number one, you guys might know him as, uh, as Mac Mule. Ben Toms, are you in the room? Come on up. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. You want to say something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A newcomer to the Dean's List this year, David Ackland. You in the room, David? Come on out, man. And lastly, leading the Dean's List for the third year in a row, he can't be here again this year, but Mike Morales, a huge contributor on a daily basis to Jamf Nation. All three of you guys and everyone else uh, in the Jamf Nation community that participates, thank you so much for helping your community members. I'm gonna go back to one, uh, one of Chip's slides for a minute, because there's, uh, there's some really poignant things that Chip touched on. If you look at Apple's revenues by year um, over the last, it's about 31 years here. Um, my history goes back with Apple devices to 1993. That's when I became a user in high school. Uh, this was the Mac OS 7 days. Uh, I think Mac OS 7.5 was the first time I knew what an operating system was. I was a high school student learning how to use music software. That really is kind of what introduced me to the platform. About four years later, I got a job uh, at our university in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, student job, started to support Macs there. And this is the Mac OS 8 days. Steve Jobs had just come back to, to Apple. Uh, a very interesting time to be really diving into technology from, uh, from that level. And in 2002, about five years later into my IT career, that's when we found a Jamf. And if you look at this chart here, why would anyone found a company that is just focused on Apple in 2002? That's actually the lowest revenue number that Apple had had since 1989. <laughs> no investor would have invested us at that time being solely focused on, on Apple. But we believed so deeply in Apple's mission and we saw what they were doing uh, when we found that this was the betas of, of Mac OS X, 10.2. This is when Mac OS X really started to mature and become a very, very viable platform uh, in the enterprise and in education. And we really thought we could help with that. We had learned a lot about IT um, through working with our Windows counterparts at that, in those days, and we wanted to be part of Apple's success. So despite where the market share was at that point, 
we started a company and for years everyone told us, if you guys want to be real doll, you have to start doing Microsoft management as well. And we said no. We don't want to do that. We love Apple and there's a reason that we love Apple. Our purpose, going back all these years, is to empower people with technology that puts human beings first. Apple creates this technology. They always have. And for us, where we play a role there, it means helping our 5,600 customers empower their 5 million end users with Apple technology. We've had a lot of growth over the last 13 years. Like Chip said, we're almost at 500 people right now. As we've grown to that level, Chip and I have had to do a lot of things that we've never done before. A lot of things that we're not really good at. And as we've been going through that, we've had to stop doing some things that we really loved and some things that we were actually good at. So as we talked about it, uh, over the last couple of years, we started talking about the idea of bringing in an external CEO. And uh, part of the reason was that Chip wanted to get back into doing uh, relationships with our partners, uh, with our customers, and I wanted to be really out with our customers, focusing on their problems, and working with our technology closer. We're better at those things than we are at making budgets. We're really bad at that. <laughs> uh, so about nine months ago, we kicked off a search for a new CEO. Very, very daunting thing. Uh, it's something that if we chose incorrectly, um, it could be a really bad thing for all of, our, uh, all of our coworkers and all of you in this room. We wanted someone with experience of growing a large organization, going through this explosive growth that we're going through. We also wanted someone that was a very good leader who could bring our organization where we need to go. So we are better at helping all of you. But most importantly, they had to believe in our purpose. They had to believe that empowering technology, empowering people with technology that puts humans first is a worthwhile thing. They had to love Apple as well. And we were very, very lucky we found this person. With that, it's my honor to introduce our new CEO, Dean Hager. Boy, that Zach uh, goes on and on and on. You can't get him off stage, can you? Uh, nobody loves the limelight like Zach does. Um, of course. <laughs> he told me yesterday that he was doing this Dean's List thing, and I thought, gosh, you know, flattered, but gosh, that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, you're the founder of the company. We call it the Zach's List. And of course, he explained to me that this is an annual thing that he does. Um, I got to tell you, I, I've been here now since the beginning of June. Uh, I'm already in love with the company. I've already so enjoyed uh, uh, connecting with the customers that I've been connected with. And I'm fascinated with the company. The story that Chip and Zach told uh, is just really amazing. And quite frankly, uh, I'm kind of fascinated with Chip and Zach personally as well. Uh, the partnership that they've had for the last 13 years is just amazing. And I wondered how that could possibly exist given how different they are. I mean, you see the difference in their personalities. And it wasn't until just moments ago that I developed a working theory, and it was during Chip's presentation when he showed this slide. While they look very, very different today, okay, 13 years ago, eerily similar. And what I want to do <laughs> is I want to wind back the clock another 10 years and find another picture, because my theory is this. Have you noticed that the last two letters in Zach's name are the first two letters in Chip's name? So here's the theory. At one point in time, they were the chip. And they were one person and the pressures of the job spliced them. And they ended up, which concerns me just a touch for the future of my job. Um, with that said, uh, I am very, very pleased to uh, be here and chat with all of you. Um, to be perfectly frank, uh, it's been intimidating to talk to you for the first time, not knowing really what you would want to hear from me. So I have really boiled it down to three things today. Number one, is just a touch about me and what drew me to JAMF. Why was I so compelled to take the job to have the opportunity to serve all of you? Number two is uh, why do I think you have the most awesome jobs ever and the people who are in the room are absolutely visionaries in the marketplace right now? And then number three, what is it that JAMF is investing in that will help you do your jobs into the future? So as long as we're starting with you know, pictures from the old days, uh, my journey to JAMF started nearly 50 years ago uh, in a small town in southern Minnesota, right on the Minnesota-Iowa border, a town called Ormsby. And I've got to ask, only people from Minnesota even have a chance 
but I'm going to buy a drink for anybody who's ever heard of the town Ormsby who isn't from Jamf. Back there? All right, I owe a couple. Find me afterwards. Uh, there are 10 times more people here than grew up in my hometown, and you can actually see the path that I walked from my front door to school every day, and it wasn't a... <laughs> It wasn't a, a one-room schoolhouse, but it was darn close. Uh, we had to gather classes, different grades together, in order to justify to get three teachers to travel into the town to actually teach us. But we were all in three different classrooms. And I really didn't know anybody in the entire town who had ever gone to a college or university. I didn't know anybody in the entire town who had ever used a computer. Um, you know, on the right side of the chart, you see uh, my dad. Uh, who was a great man, they called him uh, Big Joe uh, in the town, and just wonderful, terrific guy, but he also had a viewpoint on college that only two people went. Uh, one, those who were dry, trying to avoid work, and two, those who were trying to avoid the draft. Never mind that the draft didn't exist, but it was still, you know, <laughs> those, those details were irrelevant to my father, and the picture that's under his picture is the truck that he drove. He was a truck driver my entire life, and it was the truck that I was destined to drive. And I knew that I was going to end up being a truck driver one day, but I was in this small town growing up, and I dreamt of absolutely nothing. I, I had no vision for my life whatsoever. I was predestined. I was going to end up in that truck driving and hauling chickens and cattle and grain and you name it. And that is a perfectly wonderful um, career. I have no issues with it whatsoever. My brother went into it. Actually, two of my brothers went into it. Everybody I knew followed their uh, father into business. But it wasn't what I was meant to do. I didn't know what I was meant to do until I was 16. I assumed that it was truck driving. And when I was 16, they wheeled in to the classroom an Apple IIe computer. I first time I ever saw a computer, and I taught myself, got a book, taught myself Applesoft Basic, started writing code, and to me it was like a video game. It was just flat out fun. And one day, a teacher came into the room, I'll never forget him, uh, Jeff Price. I've thanked him many, many, many times since then. And he said, hey, Dean, you know people actually do this for a job, what you're doing? And I was like, I, I had an any idea. This is just fun. It was like asteroids. He said, no, you should really think about going to college. So I went home and talked to my dad, and we had a big fight. And I, There is no draft, OK? Uh, and I will get a job when I'm there. <laughs> so he finally agreed, and I went off to university. And I'll tell you, three years from the time that that Apple IIe was wheeled into that classroom, three years from that time, I actually had a night job coding for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, tracking the activities of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft. How does that happen? How does a life transform that much in a three-year period of time? And I'll tell you, for me, it was really just two things. It was a teacher providing me access to technology that I would have never had access to before. Done. Changed my life completely. So, you know, almost a year ago now when Zachip gave me a call and talked to me about Jamf and told me about the mission to help organizations succeed with Apple. I, I couldn't not come. It was clearly what I was ultimately destined to do. After a 25-year career in high tech, it was what I was meant to do. And it wasn't because we were hitching our wagons to Apple that was so tremendously successful. It was for the purpose that Zach talked about, that Apple does the best job that we know of in the industry of getting technology out of the way and having technology work for the user as opposed to the other way around so that you know, those famous words from Steve Jobs can be lived, and people can put their dent in the universe. That's what compelled me to come to Jamf and to serve all of you. Now, next in my presentation is why do I think you have the most awesome jobs ever? And why do I think the people who are in the room are visionaries in the marketplace? To explain that, and this might be a little bit scary, I need to go through about 40 years of technology, but I'm going to do it in under four minutes. Somebody can time me if you want, and you'll cut me off after four minutes. So let's go back to the 80s for a moment and go to that Apple IIe computer that I touched and programmed on for the very first time. It wasn't the only computer I used in the 80s because I did go off to a higher learning institution where I learned what a font was. And for a year of my life, every paper I wrote looked like a kidnapper wrote it because I changed the font like on every word, you know, just like all of us did, which was awesome. 
Then, post-college, I went off and got my first job at IBM, where I actually was a programmer for 10 years. And of course, once I started at IBM, I bought my very first computer, which of course was an IBM PC. And of course, by the end of that decade, it was running Windows. So the 1980s was really the who will win decade, right? Who was going to win? Was it going to be Apple? Was it going to be IBM? Was it going to be Microsoft? And of course, in the 90s, that got answered for us. Microsoft won in a huge, huge, unprecedented way. And furthermore, frankly, Apple and IBM uh, both lost. Microsoft came along and they absolutely owned the operating system world for the desktop. They came along and absolutely owned the application space, and not just with applications like Office, but anybody that was developing applications at the time. And I had left IBM in the 90s and went to an enterprise applications company. And you know what user interface we designed to? You know, Windows, because that was the only one you needed to design to at that time. Everybody did. So they owned the application space. And then, of course, the predecessor to SCCM was SMS, and it was all about managing groups of Microsoft-based uh, computers within an organization, and so therefore, bam, they own the enterprise. There was no question that by the end of the 1990s, Microsoft was the empire, which made Windows you know, the Death Star, if you will. Uh, then, fortunately, to stick with that analogy, 2000s, there was a, yeah, a new hope. Say it when you know it. A new hope, episode four. <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> The, and the foundation of change started to exist. Yes, still the empire was out there, but all of a sudden a few things started to happen, like the web browser. You'll say, wait a second, the web browser was in the 90s. Yes, for web pages. But the web browser was there in the 2000s for applications. And suddenly applications started to put their user interface within a web browser, and it created a level of abstraction from the device, and you were no longer tethered to a specific device. My favorite example was, in the 90s, Salesforce automation was run by Siebel. I mean, they dominated the marketplace with a Windows-based application. But in the 2000s, Salesforce.com became the dominant provider of Salesforce automation. Runs in a web browser, can run on any platform. So web browsers brought all kinds of applications to Apple. But in addition to that, Apple did something very profound during this decade, and that was moved from PowerPC to an Intel-based iMac, which brought even more applications uh, to the platform. You add on to that the huge halo effect that existed from the most unprecedented thing I'd ever seen in my life, that basically a hard drive that played music was sexy. People walking around with a hard drive in their hand, that was the coolest thing in the world, and it evolved into the phone and the iPad. Beginning of the decade, the iPod didn't exist. By the end of the decade, it advanced all the way over to the iPad. It's the miracle of iOS, quite frankly. And then if you're going to really review the decade well, you've already heard part of it. Let's not forget management software. So management software became available for the Mac in those first 10 years. And this was the new hope for, I, I only have Return of the Jedi left, so uh, the Return of the Jedi, which is essentially Apple in the enterprise, Mac being used by not just education and consumers, which they once again dominated, but all of a sudden being used in the enterprise. Surveys have been uh, said, as Chip mentioned as well, that the reason why Mac is growing so much within businesses is because of user choice. Think about that for a moment. In the 90s, we bought Microsoft-based devices at home because that's what we used at work. But today, people are using Macs at work because that's what they use at home. It is completely flip-flopped. And why not? The reason that people are using it at home because they feel more creative, more productive, and they're happier. So businesses, do you want your employees to be more creative, more productive, and happier? So therefore, user choice within the workplace has come into the fray, which is why, if you take a look at, I don't have the third quarter numbers in here uh, right now, but they're probably very similar. These are IDC's uh, numbers from the second quarter of this year of what is the growth rate of every PC, if you will, platform, or every laptop uh, platform that exists in the marketplace. And you can see that every single one of them is declining, but in the second quarter, IDC said that Apple grew 16%. And a lot of this comes from these user choice programs within business. 
But here's my provocative question, because there are some organizations who are deploying Macs for the very first time. And so they're experiencing something different than they've ever experienced before. What happens when user preference, or if user preference, becomes business preference? Now, why would that happen? Well, if you've never deployed a Mac before and you're doing it for the first time and you realize all the business benefit of it, maybe it actually becomes the preferred device that organizations can deploy. Let me just give you a quick example. When I came to Jamf, I didn't have an IT team come and sit down at my desk and carefully load the system exactly the way it needed to be loaded and hand it off to me and go, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, but you know, here's your device. I got a box on my desk that still had the shrink wrap on it, and it had a little post-it note from our IT team, and if you can't read that, let me blow it up for you. To enroll, gave me the URL, love IT. Okay, that, <laughs> my question to you right now is, are you writing love notes to your users? Because that's what we really want to do together. And that's all it takes for me to get enrolled and working and secure on a new device. By the way, when I got my new iPad, I actually brought the sticky they stuck on that one, because this one, they actually use the device enrollment program, so I'll just read it to you. Step one, yeah. Step one, open box. Step two, power on iPad. Step three, and it actually says here, there is no step three, love Jamf IT. So they're actually getting poetic now. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> The non-Apple world doesn't even know that such a thing is possible. Okay? What happens when they discover it? Let me just uh, talk, since I just referenced getting an iPad, I'm just going to say a couple of words on the iPad itself. It, of course, took the world by storm, and Apple just sold a ton of them. Predominantly, and this is just my point of view, most of them were sold as cool technology, and it was cool technology because I completely bought into it. As a matter of fact, I was one of those very, very, very few people who decided to use it as my lone work device with my prior employer. And why did I do that, by the way? Because I could not stand how long it take, took my laptop to wake up every time I opened the lid. And I was just done with it. So I decided I'm just going to figure out how to do everything from the iPad. It became my own dev lone device, and it was because the organization I was with simply would not manage manage MacBooks, but they would manage iPads. But I think most people used it as a cool technology, and I think that the next wave of iPad is going to advance from cool technology to purpose-built industry solutions. By the way, the iPad Pro is, is moving in that, uh, moves us in that direction. I would have killed for it when I was trying to use the iPad for everything. I would have absolutely killed for the iPad Pro at the time. Can't wait to get my hands on it. But it's more than that. There are some use cases out there that are absolutely perfect for the iPad. And it's for those use cases that connects organizations to their customers. Walk into an Apple retail store and find how Apple can, or iPad can completely transform retail. But the same is true within healthcare, field services, field sales, construction, restaurants. iPads can completely transform the way that organizations meet with their customers, and in some cases be used by their customers. In the healthcare field, for instance, I think that an iPad should be mounted to every single hospital bed in the world. Because if you've ever been in a hospital bed, first of all, you're not feeling very good. And so therefore, digging for everything that's around you, whether it be the menu, the nurse call button, or the remote control for the TV, it's a nightmare. If all of it could just be automated on an iPad, it would be a killer solution within healthcare. So somebody go off and write that, please. Um, <laughs> and by the way, that vision of iOS applications, that is exactly the core of what I can't believe happened. If you would have asked me, you know, in 1980, you know, would Apple and IBM come together? I would have said, are you nuts? There's no way one, you know, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. Oh, you know, I guess they can actually come together. You know, everybody can come together eventually. And uh, Apple and IBM came together specifically around industry applications for iOS that would drive volumes of Apple devices. But that almost wasn't... There was an announcement that came a little bit later that almost got more press, and that was IBM's decision, and they publicly announced this, to implement a choice program where IBM, the maker of the IBM PC, would start to deploy MacBooks to their employees. 
It hit the presses huge. Jam fortunately had an opportunity to work with IBM on this project. And right here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, you're going to hear from the IT leader about that deployment. And I'm telling you, that's a don't miss event. It is fascinating the project that they've gone through, the rate at which they're deploying devices, and the response and the business benefit they've seen. I promise that every single one of you will get something out of that presentation. Fletcher Previn's going to be here, and it is an absolute amazing presentation. IBM then decided to take the experience that they had deploying Macs internally and actually build a product around it. This is the IBM website where they call Mobile First Managed Mobility Services for OS X. And it is where they've said, hey, we're going to go out and deploy these devices for other organizations. And of course, you'll notice on the website, if I blow it up, that they're basing it around Jamf Software's Casper Suite. And some of you may have a question about, well, what does that actually mean you know, in the uh, 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 Jamf world? Well, we're going to continue to do the things that we've always done. You may have seen this chart sometime in the past. We refer to it as our whole product experience. We write software. That's our product. But we need to provide the support, the training, the services, the partner ecosystem, and the community that we do with Jamf Nation all around it. This is our whole product experience, right? Well, IBM has just come along and said, you know what? We, we believe if we can take your software, Jamf, we can actually go out and provide that whole product experience for those that want to work with IBM. And we'll actually do the, the deployment and the management of the devices. We'll go all the way there to essentially a, a managed service offering. That's really what the IBM product is. But that doesn't mean the Jamf isn't going to do it. That's just a partner that we have that is embracing the same software that you've embraced, that we're embracing, and we're going to continue to provide all of the elements around the whole product experience for all of you. But this brings me now to uh, the last point that I have in the presentation, and that is, what are we investing in that will actually help you do your job uh, going forward? So let's drill in on the product question just a little bit. And just for clarity, our R&D dollar, our research and development dollar, really goes into one of four areas. Casper Suite, which needs no explanation right here. Casper Focus, which is predominantly uh, built for the education industry to improve teacher uh, effectiveness and student learning. Bushel, which I'm not really talking a lot about from this stage, and quite frankly, the reason is because this isn't necessarily the market it's designed for. The customer the Bushel is designed for is the organization that's so small that they don't have an IT organization yet. In other words, it might take the head of marketing or the CEO of the organization or you know, the finance person to say, could you actually enroll all these devices in some piece of software? I don't even know what it would be where we could actually keep track of these devices and make sure that they're secure and password protected and all of that kind of good stuff and maybe connected to the Wi-Fi and we could deploy a few applications to them. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, let's just sign on and do that. And I actually tested that a little bit. I'm such an Apple fan, and I've got a, a, a three daughters uh, and a wife, so we have a family of five. We have a lot of Apple devices. And I just wanted to see what kind of software that Jamf wrote. So when I was interviewing, I actually went out to Bushel, enrolled in it, and I had 10 devices at home, and I just enrolled them all uh, into Bushel just to see what the experience would be like for a small business, because I practically had as many devices as a small business would have. And proved it out. I had never been in IT in the job of device management before. And all of my devices at home are actually still enrolled in Bushel and still paying $2 per device per month. One would have thought that I would have actually got a discount after I got the job, but that's what I'm paying. <laughs> uh, now, investment into these product lines is the investment that we're making into the engineering front. And just so you know, you actually saw some growth that Zach showed you uh, in the areas of support personnel. If you take a look at just engineering personnel, from October last year when we did JNUC to October this year, we've grown it by 60%. But I've also run this out for another few months just to show you the rate of growth that we've already approved into the plan. And if you look at the next six months, we're actually planning to grow engineering resources twice as fast as we've grown them the last six months. So we're going to do a lot of hiring because we have a lot of plans for wanting to develop more product for you. In addition to that, we did, uh, you know or may know, that our two development centers are in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and also in Minneapolis. We did open a third so we, that we could get three uh, organizations uh, recruiting at the same time. And that third is actually in Europe because we actually have such a growing population 
of customers over in Europe. Um, and I, mean, I just came off a road show where I traveled around through Asia and Australia and Europe meeting customers, and we actually had more attendees of our road shows outside of the U.S. than we had of our road shows inside the U.S. So the, the attention is growing substantially outside the U.S. So we felt actually adding an uh, R&D center outside the U.S. would be uh, a smart thing to do. And so our third R&D center is in Katowice, Poland. And I won't go into details about why Katowice, Poland. Just a lot of research goes into that, and we have uh, already started to staff it, and we're very, very optimistic about the ability to build a whole lot more new product for you. Now, what new product might we be building? Most of it is going to funnel into the Casper suite. And just as you know, Zach said, you know, when people ask, what is the strategy of the Casper suite? The strategy of the Casper suite is really to empower you to empower people. When I was traveling around the world and I was listening to customer presentations, and I can't wait to listen to the customer presentations here, there was one theme that came through loud and clear, self-sufficiency. Let's make the users self-sufficient. And rather than thinking about managing their devices, which frankly kind of feels like restricting people in some way, let's figure out a way to empower them and provide more services to them. Yes, we do have to have you know, rules around the usage of the device. You know, maybe a user might think of it as a break. But I prefer to think of breaks not as the thing that stops you, but rather the things that helps you go really, really fast and have the freedom to do so. So what we want to do is actually have you work with and manage the devices to give permission to your users to go really, really fast. Now, the areas that we're going to invest in within Casper Suite really fit into one of these, I, I refer to them as swim lanes or priority areas. Of course, the two bottom ones, that's just the price of entry for the job that we have. We have to have a robust system and architecture, and we have to stay current with Apple releases. That's our strategy. Everything else is bonus on top of that. The other priorities that we have is end user experience and empowerment, streamlining the IT job, cloud computing, which more and more and more of you are actually requesting to run uh, the JSS in the cloud, and then industry solutions on top of that. So let me just really quickly walk up this slide, and we'll call it a morning. First of all, in the area of system architecture, there are two predominant priorities for us that rise to the top. One is scalability, and the other is stability. Very quickly on scalability, you know, that is, you're not going to see that come out as, oh, hey, this is our scalability release. That's something that we're going to be investing in release after release after release. We have some enormous rollouts that are occurring right now, and we know that we have to stay in front of customers and that we've been on the edge of doing that with some of you, and so we're doubling down our efforts to be able to get way out in front from a scalability perspective. On the stability front, full confession here, about a year ago, we more or less stopped investing in new stuff for a while just to focus in our energies on the stability of the platform. And it was the right thing to do. But I'm going to be real frank with you. I never want to have to do it again because I never want to get ourselves in that position again. And if you have a plan and stick to it, you appropriately balance resources against it, and then you prioritize quality over time. We've talked a lot about this internally, and we've basically come to the conclusion that customers will forgive us for tardiness before you'll forgive us for poor quality. So we're going to live by that going forward you know, forevermore. <laughs> There's also the realization that you know, when iOS 9 came out, my 13-year-old daughter came running in the room on the day that it was released and said, hey, Dad, I just upgraded my phone. We live in such a different world today because that's just weird. All right, The fact that... You know, uh, any teenager on the day that a new operating system comes out will just upgrade themselves on the day that it's released. It's such a radically different world than where technology was in 10 years ago. And for her to have that kind of trust 
In iOS 9, on the day that it came out, that's the kind of trust you have to have in our releases on the day they come out. And I'll be straight with you. On the day that we came out with 9.8 and 9.81, I'm sitting on Jamf Nation. Refresh, 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 refresh. Because <laughs> I can't wait to see what you're going to say about it. And I'm cringing, and I'm hopeful that it will be, hey, we just implemented it. And that, in both cases, the first post I saw was just implemented it, and it went well. And that's what we're looking for. On that front, we know that we have to have same-day support on both you know, iOS and OS X, and we do. However, another confession, and that this year, we came out with iOS 9 support in 9.8 on the day that uh, uh, iOS 9 was available. However, on day zero, we did not support VPP device-based assignment, and that is not living up to our own standards. And so we're going back and post mortaring that and making sure that that doesn't happen next year. By the way, we did support it 14 days later in 9.81. And, and for the most part, that stays in front of where most of our competitors are. But we don't develop product for our competitors. We develop product for you. And you've said flat out that those kind of features you want day zero support of. And that's our commitment to you. As I walk up this chart a little bit more, one area that we believe, because we are not, Cross-platform, we don't try to go out and support every type of device that's out there. We don't believe in the least common denominator way of uh, developing technology, but rather go deep and create a differentiated user experience. And when it comes to the users of the devices of what we all support, it really comes down to two things, enrollment and assignments of uh, content on that device, and then also self-service. On the self-service front, we just had a focus group yesterday to prioritize some of the things that we're looking at developing. And things like private labeling of self-service, things like improved user interface, globalization of self-service so that the users will always have a localized interface, those are all priorities for us. Plus, there were some ideas that today self-service is really IT packaging up content, going out through the user and then to the device. There's actually some value to taking some information from the device, exposing it to the user, and actually moving it back to IT as well. So we're going to double down on self-service, and we're going to create a very interesting user experience for all of your users over the course of the next year as well. As I... What we really want to do is we want you all to look like rock stars, you know, that you're able to provide services and support to your customers in a way that no other manager of any other device can possibly do. That's what our goal is. Now, how about streamlining your work? So you remember this little thing for those that were at JNUC last year called patch management. My understanding is it actually got a pretty positive reaction. Uh, my guess is that some of you might have come this year thinking that we were going to release patch management this year. Uh, we're not, right? That doesn't say that we're not going to release it, but remember what I said earlier about prioritizing quality over time. This was one of those hard pills that we had to swallow if we were really going to prioritize that. There's three reasons why we're not releasing patch management right now. One is a year ago when we did talk about it, we did have to step back and evaluate quality and just work on that for several months. Two, several of you came up to us after that presentation and said, if you don't do this right, you could cause us more problems than you can create benefit for us. And so we actually went into a redesign and really worked with customers of what exactly is needed as we look out to the marketplace for patches that are available and as we get reporting from the devices that we have internally and how we meld the two in a non-disruptive way. And we did a more sophisticated way of designing the way the product was going to work. And then we started the development of it. And we talked at the time. This would have been, you know, very, very early summer. And we talked at the time of, gosh, you know, we got to deliver it by JNUC because that's what we talked last week or last year. And we really examined our navels, if you will, on that one and said, but we also said that we were going to prioritize quality over time. And if we do that, then we're going to ship it when it's done. We're not going to ship it by a date that we, that is artificial, quite frankly. And so that's the approach that we've taken. Patch management is going to ship iteratively in the coming months and over the coming uh, six months. We will keep you up to date throughout that process. We're working diligently on it. We have a dedicated team on it. They're doing some incredible stuff, and I think you are absolutely going to love it. But most importantly, you are going to completely trust it when it comes out to you. 
After that, we're turning our focus into uh, provisioning, which is essentially the same sort of what are the workflows and IT streaming that we can do in the area of provisioning. You're going to hear about some of the things that IBM did in this area uh, tomorrow morning. And I'm telling you, we learned a lot from it. We've learned a lot from our customers of new workflows that we can add to our provisioning process to streamline your work. Then very quickly, as I hit these top two levels, in the area of cloud computing, First of all, you know, content and distribution. We're adding functionality right now. It's actually not in the not too distant future for uh, managing content and distributing via the cloud. And then also enterprise integration, specifically integrating with your single sign-on you know, through SAML, integrating with your LDAP, and also certificate lifecycle management are all prioritized projects. And of course, that kind of functionality is not limited to just those that are running in the cloud. That enterprise integration obviously would serve you well, even behind the firewall. And then finally, industry solutions. You know, you saw IBM is developing iOS applications to specifically go out and serve industries. Uh, our number one industry that we serve is education, and we are defining a dedicated education, what's called a scrum team or a development team, that is only going to build towards the needs of education. And we actually had a focus group on that as well yesterday to talk about what some of those priorities are. That is going to be the first area that we're looking to develop new capabilities specifically around teacher effectiveness and student learning. And after that, we will evaluate some of the other industries that are out there, we're very interested in the retail, healthcare, food services, and uh, construction and uh, field services uh, spaces. And I'll tell you, if any of you are working with some iOS applications and you see, wow, you know, Ca Casper Suite could really bring some value to this application if you just did this. I would love to hear from you, as would the rest of the Jamf team. Just some time across me while we're at this uh, event over the next few days, and I would love to hear what you have to say. And then across, across all of this, because we have 20 countries here represented, we have committed ourselves, and especially with the new R&D center that we have, we have committed ourselves to localize the product you know, throughout for worldwide rollout. We're going to start on the user side, so on the self-service and enrollment side. We're going to do documentation, and we're going to work our way uh, backwards to the IT admins. However, along the way, even focus on the user side, that does improve the quality of work for the IT team, because frankly, we have a lot of customers rolling out in a lot of languages today. They just have to work too hard at it. And so we're committed to actually make that a much, much easier process. How will we keep you up to date on all of these things that I'm talking about today? Of course, we're going to use Jamf Nation. That's our community. That's the way that we're going to stay connected uh, with our customers. I will be there at the release of every new product that's going to come between now and next year, JNUC. Refresh, 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 refresh to see what you have to say about it. So that's what we're investing in. You also heard why I think you have the coolest jobs around because you believed in the Mac, you believed in Apple, and I think the rest of the world is ultimately going to follow. And you also heard why I came to Jamf and why I was so compelled uh, to serve you. And it really had to do with that vision of getting technology out of the way and providing devices to whether it be to that 16-year-old kid, you know, or whether it be the CEO of your organization. And I came to Jamf, and what I ended up finding was a group of people, and you've met so many of them, that are about as selfless as any group of people I've ever met, and completely committed to improving ourselves so that we can serve you. We've made some mistakes in the last year. We've made some, I make mistakes every day, but we're absolutely committed to improving upon what we've done for you in the past so that we can serve you better in the future. And then ultimately, it's the three of us, right? It's Apple, it's Jamf, it's you that together provide that solution to the 16-year-old kid or the CEO of an organization that empowers people, or better yet, that person, with technology that puts humans first. So with that said, my very first JNUC, I am absolutely, completely excited to be here. Thank you for your patience this morning and being here. Have a great show.